Thanks for joining us here for episode 7 of CRC Speed Show TV. We're basically eight weeks away from the CRC Speed Show Expo. And the news for you is that we have created a screen icon section for 2018. Yes, and it's blooming exciting. Think Knight Rider, Gone in 60 Seconds, Dukes of Hazard, Mad Max, just name a few. Dukes of Hazard. Mm. Dukes of Hazard? Mate, Daisy won't be there. But Herbie the V-Dub will be there, which is probably more your style, to be honest. Pick all that. Well, as always, the show will have plenty for you to look at, including the 10 Tools Grand National Rod and Custom Show. It's the biggest indoor rod meet in the country. It is a must view. Loves a good rod. Now, I'm kind of looking forward personally to the Retro Arama. I think, you know, shopping mall, think retro, think market. So clear some space in the shed or the pool room because there will be something there that catches your eye and you could be taking it home. You could take him home. Yep, we all love a good market, and it's even better when it's full of car stuff, and speaking of full of car stuff, the live action arena will be happening all weekend long. Plenty of cool viewing for the fans. We just need to think of a challenge, something I can thrash you at for the gloating points. Early bird tickets are available online. Just head to speedshow.co.nz. Right, now another news. Oh, actually, are you having a rant this week, or? Nah, nothing, I mean... nothing's annoyed me this week. Oh, fair enough. Uh, back to the news then. Porsche in the USA made a recall for the 918 Spider. But get this, sixth recall for this actual car. It's had faulty seatbelts, wiring that short circuits. Uh, the latest is um, apparently corrosion stress cracks in the suspension system. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sucks. Hey, Fraser, cars is 30. 1988, Neil Fraser took the first one to the National Car Show. It's still getting orders today. And surprisingly, the majority of orders are exports, Australia and Japan. But if you want one, you can still buy one here in New Zealand. Now you and I went separate ways last weekend. I went to the sunny Hawks Bay for the three day Targa. You went to a miserable and wet Hampton Downs to watch cars go around there for three hours. Yeah, endurance race. Mm, fairly new in the north, been happening in the south for a while. What an epic weekend. Got to catch up with some pretty damn awesome people too, including Johnny Mac. Here's some of the action. I could talk about it forever, he knows that. Um, but here's some visual stuff. <laughs> Thanks very much.
for having a chat. Um, busy day out here at Hampton, of course, but um, you know, for a young fella, you've been around a wee bit, burnt some miles, you know, uh, collected some silverware in the process as well. Do you have a pool room? At the, at the home in Nelson? Not quite yet, no. I'll, uh, maybe I'll get into that one day, but um, no, I'd rather focus on what my girls need, cricket bats and uh, things like that. Oh, actually, that's a good point. You know, the family aren't necessarily following in the footsteps? No, not yet, but uh, you never know. Um, if they want to, then they just need to come and see Dad and, um, and tell me what their plan is and how they're going to fund it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the funding, yeah. Uh, so, it, but actually, kind of speaking of that, it's sort of, it all started in Hawke's Bay for you before Nelson. Uh, and as a teenager, you know, you're making quite a name for yourself. Were you born with petrol in the veins? Where did it all stem from? Oh yeah, absolutely. If you can pan out to um, to a guy over there doing the tyres, that's my dad, Don, and he, he's he been racing for years at club level, and uh, I used to be his gopher, and now luckily he's mine. Um, he's been a bit short-changed because I was only his for about five minutes and I was useless, and he's been doing it for about 20 years, so more actually, I think 25 years, so yeah, that, that's where we got it from. Swings and roundabouts, I quite like that. Now we'll, we'll have to go over and chat to him and see if he's got any stories, but uh, just sort of, you know, Fast forwarding a little bit, um, Manfield must be a place dear to your heart. Oh, absolutely. It's the first place I watched uh, Dad race, and uh, then first place I actually went on at, at a track at uh, age 13, although very slowly. Um, yeah. <laughs> 2K Cup would uh, blow by uh, the old Fiat that I used to have, but yeah, that was the start of it, and then we were very lucky to, to win the Shell Ultra Challenge in 1992, and you know, without that, you know, I'm not sure that we would have got any further. Yeah. Wellington Street Race, that's one that goes back in time too, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Look, every time you go to Wellington, you wish you could still have it on. But yeah, had a had a win around there in the Centra GTs. Um, yeah, great great memories um, of you know New Zealand motor racing, and it's probably in its heyday. Of course, most, most people watching uh, and, and people who know the name uh, and follow the career and things like that would think, you know, V8, supercars, ITM 400, Bathurst. Is it possible to pull, you know, one career highlight? You know, I mean, the, the, your career is nowhere near being over by any means. But I mean, is there any highlight there? I think probably winning the third V8 championship is probably the one. Uh, hadn't been done before. We're running our own team, doing everything ourselves. I think that was a really, really cool moment. Obviously, the Aussie stuff was was amazing as well. Um, getting a podium, a couple of podiums at the surface with Shane was was great. But probably doing our own thing and um, and beating the best best people at the time in New Zealand was was cool. So from V8s to Porsche, was that a bit of adjusting? Oh look, it definitely is. Um, but you know, when you start focusing on endurance racing, there's one name that always pops up, and that's Porsche. And um, so, I've been working with Simon Gilbertson for since 2014. He had a 997, and we were doing the coaching and also uh, prepping his car. And then, after a couple of years, we had a run in the Camaro, which was eight liters of V8, and that was a lot of fun with Inky Tullock's team. And then. Uh, we decided uh, Simon wanted to get his own own team going. We put it all together, and we've had four race meetings, and uh, this is our fifth one. And really enjoying it. Really, really, uh, the, the, you know, the field's so strong now. We're having to drive the car very hard to stay uh, within the front top five. Well, that's the thing. It's been around since around 2013, hasn't it? Around, around about that time uh, in terms of endurance. Um, but uh, it, it's something that's you know, the podiums are chocker now, eh? Absolutely. Look, I mean, this, both the North and South Island series have have kind of been going along for quite a long time in the background but over time uh, people have, have wanted to come to a race meeting where you're only here for two days you get a lot of seat time you end up you can drive some very cool cars up the front or you can roll out in, in a, something in a smaller class car and everyone everyone gets to do the same race so it's really really appealing and it's and it's very you know it's growing because you can see the level that's uh, the level of entries in both 30 and each this weekend for the one and the three hour and it's a great testament to the series and how are you uh, looking this weekend so far of course, qualifying was yesterday, Friday, uh, but today's today's the big day. How are you looking at the moment? Yeah, look, we've we've ended up uh, qualifying fifth in, in the wet and then fifth in the dry, which is about where we sit for overall car speed. And then um, we just hopefully got to get to the end of three hours, no mistakes. Hopefully one pit stop rather than two, and um, you know, see where we end up. But you know, it's motor racing; anything could happen. And that's why we love it. Right, you're on in about 10 minutes, so uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks very much, and uh, all the very best. Great, guys. Thanks, everyone, to Speed Show TV. So, well, it's such a shame you had to go and hang out in the bad weather. I was able to wander around in shorts and a T-shirt, sunnying it up in Havelock North. Yeah. This is how it all unfolded. Targa has been a regular host to unusual race cars, 
but sometimes it's difficult to know if it's a classic or a modern. Oh, it's a bit of both. I think the chassis came off in 1999 Discovery and then it finished off in uh, 2013. So, uh, yeah, I suppose it crosses both sides of the line. Yeah. How does it handle? Oh, brilliant, yeah. Doesn't seem to, anything they, on the roads doesn't seem to worry anything. The stones, the grass, well, you're not meant to go on the grass, but we lowered the springs down two inches just to give us a better ride and um, it was a cheap fix. So, yeah, we put it in there to go. Oh, I love them, mate. Yeah, you gotta love them, hey. <laughs> Land Rover people, normal people don't understand, so yeah. So while some competitors are having a great time, others like Terry and Frank may not so much. Ran out of talent, I think, is probably the politest way of putting it. Just a bit hot through there, got wide into the grass and just spun it and across the road and up the bank. So yeah, that's us for this uh, target. Just disappointed, but you know, that's what happens. Just a bit too quick. Yeah, bit too I mean, quick. we're all right, so that's fine. Meanwhile, at the head of the field, Nick Duval and Martin Dippy are leading their respective classes. But the battle for production GT4 now falls in favour of Ivan North since the demise of yesterday's leader, Sam Calloway, and Clark Proctor, whose car wouldn't start after the morning stages. Today we've just been steady. Once we got onto the dry going, um, we put our foot down and, and really pushed. And despite the battle with the Merc, in the classic two-wheel drive section, Mark and Chris Kirkbenand are runaway class leaders. We're battling with this Mercedes and it's just awesome, you know, two sort of DTM era cars uh, having a good time and he's a good driver. As Sunday stages rolled through, there were major changes starting to unfold. Ivan North was off the road on the opening run, handing the production GT4 lead back to Rory Calloway. Those particular changes don't do much to help Clark Proctor's race though. Hey, master switch in the car. For some reason failed, we came into service, turned the car off, didn't even touch the master switch. Went to leave early to get ahead of everything and just no power to anything and then the computer wouldn't talk to the laptop and all the old electronic stuff of these modern cars, but it turns out to be a you know, $20 part as usual. In classic two-wheel drive, Mark Kirkbenand lost his overnight lead because of a rather unique breakdown. Co-driver Chris KB explains. So we broke a throttle cable about 6 or 8k into the stage, so we stopped. We pulled the cable out of the inner, put it in the navigator side window, and so I've been pulling that, but it's very thin, you know, very, very skinny, and it was really hard to hold on to. Now we've put ties onto it and uh, a bit of a knot to put the finger through and so we did the last stage fully on the throttle cable with me doing the throttle and arc changing gear. Continuing with the leading car dramas, Nick Deval is out altogether. It's not good news, we, uh, we're leading the rally and then unfortunately we have got a problem with the engine. I think we may have dropped a valve and we're on three cylinders so uh, we can't carry on. That's the cruelty of rallying. Unaware of Duval's issues, a gloating Martin Dippy felt ecstatic to have pulled seven seconds from the leading four-wheel drive Subaru. Yes, he did, but we were running on three cylinders, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> David Rogers was struggling to stay in the top five. We had a bit of a brake issue once again this morning because we were trying the previous setup, which just to make sure that that was the problem when I was being careful on them and uh, still had trouble, so there's a bit more to come yet. However, there have been no problems for Robert Darrington, and he is inside the top five. We've got a reliable car, with, um, you know, and it fits like a glove. It's, we've driven it for seven or eight years now, um, and yeah, having lots of fun. Just good co-driver, who we've been working with again for a long while. And despite having never done a Targa, V8 touring car driver Hayden McKenzie is a quick learner. Uh, biggest thing for us is just reading the road. There's um, knowing where the road goes. The amount of times you go over a little crest or through a corner, you go, geez, I've left a lot on the table. Um, but your yeah, biggest thing is just being knowing where the road goes, how hard you can push it, and, and learning the car, actually. down to the final few stages of Targa Hawks Bay. After multiple class lead changes in the morning, the leaderboard opened up. Clark Proctor bounced back to win all the afternoon stages. 
Mark Kirkbanan spent the afternoon clawing back the lead that he'd lost to Mark McCorn in the HW Richardson Classics. <laughs> Scott's up work, eh? We just had a few issues with the car and the throttle cable out and um, we just had great problems this afternoon as well. Andrew Sims' production GT4 goes to the man who had the early lead from Friday, Rory Calloway. Had a bit of a scare at one point today, which was uh, at that point got told to pull my head in a wee bit. So, um, no, absolutely amazing. And then came the drama. After dicing with rally leader Nick Duval all weekend, Martin Dippy only needed to finish the rally. But in the last stage, he had an off and provisionally handed the global security all comers an outright win to Stephen Kirkbanan in his two wheel drive BMW hot rod. Into first place. That's awesome. <laughs> I feel bad for Dippy, I really do, but if that's the case, then I'm very, very chuffed. Rob Darrington picked up second. Finally got, got a result, so second overall, which is great, and nice to see a BMW got first, so, you know, three BMWs, first, second and third. And Mike Tubbs, third on the podium, and provisionally Global Security Production GT2 winner. It's nice to hear at the uh, finish line that we've actually um, got into third place overall and first in our class, so I think that I'm proud, we're really proud, aren't we Mike? We're just so pleased about that. That ends the weekend in Hawke's Bay. Next stop on the target trail for 2018 will be a regroup in the South Island in late October for Targa New Zealand. How's Bowles Targa? That looks good, eh? Can we like flip a coin or arm wrestle or something like that for the next one? Yeah, okay. Because, you know, you get to go all over the place. Anyway, speaking of which, you actually left the Auckland region and went to... What, are you going to have a look at a garage or something? Yeah, I went to another workshop. I oh. wanted to find out the history of one of the more established race crews in New Zealand. They've been around a long time. Go have a look at this. We've travelled way out west in the mighty Speed Show TV machine and had our passports checked to come into the wilderness, the wilderness of West Auckland, because out here is a workshop run by a man who's been doing it since, well, Kumu, really, that long and he's done a lot in his motorsport career. He's set up a lot of cars, he's looked after a lot of drivers, and we really need to hear his story. We'll go have a chat, shall we? Come with me. So this is the workshop. It's a fairly big workshop, and yes, it's got a lot of cars in it, and a couple of people that actually do some work. It's the home of AV8 Motorsport. And so here we are now inside the workshop with the man himself is Mr. Anderson. Mm -hmm. It's Wayne and he is AV8 Motorsport and you have been around longer than almost cars themselves doing this kind of thing. Let's go right back, shall yeah, we? That, that's not fair saying right. how old I am. Yeah. I'm not as old as Kenny Smith yet. Oh, okay then. Right <laughs> back to the, well he was horse and car, carts and horses, to the early days. The first days when you said, I'm going to start doing this as my hobby, my job, my income, my work, my career, doing race cars. How far ago was that? Well, it first started off when Bruce and I were racing around um, cars. Like Bruce, he started first. Well, my old man started first, actually, then Bruce. And uh, then I was a little tacker following Bruce around, and um, then he stopped racing for about 10 years. And then after that, we got into racing. When the first race car we had was an old XD Falcon, looked very similar shape as this one here. And, um, and then we, we built a XE, and then we had some Group A Mustangs, and then we stopped racing for about a, another six years, and then uh, I started getting into uh, muscle cars, and I built myself a Camaro, and then Bruce built a uh, Mustang, which he still runs today, and I think he's been running that now for nearly 25, 30 years. But, but yet you haven't yet tried to hark back to how many years ago that was. What are we talking when you got into racing and then got into building cars? I was, born 19... in, I was born in 55, so you just work forward from there. Oh, OK. So let's show <laughs> what are we saying. Sometime in the 70s or the 80s? Uh, oh, well, I was following Bruce around in the 70s. Yes. But the 80s when we started racing. OK. 1982, 81 sort of thing. Yep. So when you, you if we go back to those first Falcons, yep. were they a backyard shed job? You know, Kiwi blokes in the shed with a few hand tools and away we go, we'll build a race car to whatever. Or, or well, did you actually well, set well, up a proper shop to do it? No, nah, no. Nah, the first one was an X one which we bought off old Nicky Bigovich and, and uh, it was an automatic one and back in those days you had to run automatic and of course they blew up all the time and the automatic part did 
and uh, it, so we, then we ventured on and we got a proper race shop in probably 83, 84 when we had Ken Hopper there working for us because that was at the sawmill at that stage. Was that the point in time where you said this is my future, building race cars? No, definitely not, no, no, I, I was still working full time at the sawmill and uh, it wasn't until the later stage that um, after we built about four cars in the workshop there for ourselves uh, at Pine Pack, um, then I decided to uh, get out of the sawmill industry and Bruce, my brother, bought me out and that was about 99. And then for a hobby, I thought I'd build myself a NZV8 touring car. Just as a casual hobby? Yeah. yeah. And we had to do something when I first got out of the business. And uh, from basically two, 2000 onwards, uh, we've built probably now 12, 14 cars. So, and uh, probably more so it's come a full-time job uh, doing this now since my son Tony's been here. And he's been working probably now five or six years, about six years now, isn't it, Tony? Yeah, he's ferreting away in the yeah, background, trying yeah, to look busy. Yeah, yeah about, yeah, about, yeah, six, yeah, years, about he's, six years. He's doing and, his best. And, and Tony's the main fabricator here. Right. He, he does all the welding and... Um, cutting and shutting on all the metalwork because my eyesight's you know, not that good when I get the... Close. It's an age thing again. It, it is. Yes. It is. My glasses are getting stronger all the time. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must over those years then, not only doing cars for yourself, for your own team, for your family, but the ones you've done for clients. People have said, actually, we want you to do our car. We want you to either build it, set it up, uh, repair it, whatever. You must have a heck of a lot of stories that you can't share, but what, maybe a well, couple of the cool ones. Well, yeah, we, we, the first um, uh, uh, VE Commodore we built was for Paul Emanuel for the, for the Targa. And, and, and that was a quite an exciting program because that was a, virtually a brand new car when the VE Commodores had just come out. So you, you're dealing with a, a car that was worth $60,000 new. And, and you pull it apart and you make a race car out of it. And uh, we made it for a Tiger, this particular one. And he competed in the Tiger on two or three occasions. And, and then he bought it back a couple of times to fix it because he nosed into a bank. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, maybe that's not a story he wants to share, but OK. And then there's, there's other people. I mean, you even had a tie-up at one stage with Andy Booth, didn't you? Yeah, well, Andy Booth, all the cars that he's driven here in New Zealand as tin tops has all been uh, my cars. And uh, he drove for me for about 10, 10, might be 12 years, driving the NZV8s. Over those years, the changes in motorsport that you must have seen have been up and down, and it's always going to be up and down. Is motorsport still strong in New Zealand, you believe, to be able to keep going as a, a fabricating workshop in motorsport? Well, the, the strongest point in motor racing at the moment is all the people which have my age, <laughs> and a little bit younger, and, they, and all, their, all the cars they can remember as kids as Mustangs, Camaros or Falcons or whatever. So the muscle car side of things, uh, people are, are really strong in building that and they've got the money to build the cars. And oh, just recently I just done a 69 Camaro for, for a chap and uh, he's just using it for his own pleasure. He's not actually going to race it in muscle cars as we decided uh, he wanted to build outside the rules, that's all right. And uh, then he just races around Hampton Downs with it and having great fun. So it's still there then? Oh, yeah. There's the opportunity yeah. still for people who want race cars built. Yeah, and, and I think probably in, in the future it's going to be hard to get somebody that does jack of all trades, is like to bring a body shell to somebody and say, You want to drive out the door with a race car. Um, younger people can't sort of, you know, without training, do all that. And so it's. Once all the old fellows die, I suppose the electric car will come along and, and, <laughs> and they'll race them. <laughs> I know that uh, uh, Andrew, is the Anderson, is coming into Central Muscle Cars. Uh, will Tony go there one day, you think? Uh, and then yeah. what about the rest of these grandchildren as well? Oh, I know. Well, Tony's got two other cars he races in GT1 uh, now. And uh, no, I'm not going to give him my little Monza to play around with in muscle cars. Uh, he's, got, he's got too many toys now. Right. OK. So a, a grandchildren thing. Granddaughters, grandchildren, well, nephews, nieces. Well, the, the grandchildren, the, the two boys, they're, they're keen on, on cars and uh, they, they can steer them around the paddock now at the age they are. Um, but the, th the, the thing is, I've got a little four-cylinder Monza, which I bought the other day. Maybe I can gift that to one of them, that, that could be their start. It's 78 horsepower. What I'm thinking though is at 78 years old eventually when you get yes. there, and then 88 you'll still be building cars for the family and you won't get a chance to go out and play. 
Oh, they'll take, they'll take the old codger for a ride, I imagine. Yeah, that'll be. <laughs> let's hope it is. Hey, thanks. Appreciate your time and the visit. Yeah, there you go. Good one. Catch you later. Wow, hey, that's a lot of history. A lot of histories. And really cool that they haven't stopped doing what they're doing yet. Actually, speaking of cool, you know how you've been showing us these crazy motorsports yes. that you want me to try? Yes. Well, I think I might have found something suitable for um, <laughs> a man of your stature. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah? Pretty sure this will be perfect for you. Introducing... Vespa Motocross. I reckon I'm going off you. <laughs> right, that's us for this episode. Remember, we still want your viewer vids, so if you have a cool machine and want to show it to us and everyone else, just grab your camera and walk around it and tell us all about it. But most importantly, in the next episode, we will reveal our special guest for this year's CRC Speed Show. But now it's time to sign off, so let's continue with our countdown of our top five craziest motorsports, one of which somehow will get you to try We've had plate racing, we've had sidecar motocross now, we've had Vespa cross. Love and the plate racing. Yeah, train. You want to do plate racing, don't you? I want to do plate racing. There's more to see first before you make your decision. Okay. Bye bye for now. Yeah.